Hello, everyone. This is Melissa Lentz. I'm the Director of Education at OSEG, and I'd like to welcome you to our webcast today, during which we will discuss operationalizing the ESG business imperative. We are glad you can join us for this event. While some view environmental, social, and governance requirements and reporting as merely an extension of earlier sustainability movements, there is a significant shift from the morality-based thinking that drove those efforts to do the right thing toward a view that ESG is beneficial to the business itself from an economic perspective. Companies can look proactively at ESG as a source of new opportunity for innovation in products and services, and use this drive to adapt their spending and processes for more sustainability and social responsibility. To go beyond meeting ESG reporting demands and also benefit from its ESG capability, the organization should build an integrated approach that supports business objectives, addresses uncertainty, and enables the organization to act with integrity. In other words, the ESG capability can and should contribute to principled performance. For our discussion today, we are joined by the following speakers. Svetlana Zenkin, Senior Product Marketing Manager, Environmental, Social, and Governance with ServiceNow. Mark Waller, Managing Director, GRC Technology with KPMG. Carl Kimball, Principal with Strata ESG. And Carol Switzer, Co-Founder and President of OSEG. We are very pleased to be joined by these speakers for a detailed discussion of how to build the business case for operationalizing ESG to drive beneficial business outcomes. But before we start, I'd like to take a minute to go over a few housekeeping notes. First, regarding continuing education credit. We provide NASBA approved CPE credit to you for participation in live webinars if you have an OSEG all access pass, which you can purchase individually or as part of a company subscription. The All Access Pass includes many benefits in addition to CPE credit for webcasts, such as access to all OSED resources and on-demand education series. So if you don't already have a pass, I would encourage you to check it out on the OSEG site. If you do have an All Access Pass and would like a certificate of completion for CPE for this event, please be sure to stay with us for the entire hour and to answer all the polls. These are requirements for receiving CPE credit for this event. And please note, certificates of completion for CPE credit are available only for live events. They are not available for viewing archived webinars. Second, regarding the recording from this webcast. In a couple of days, we will have the recording of this event posted on the OSED website. Just log into the site, then go to the webinars tab and select past webinar recordings, and then this webcast. This recording may be viewed by anyone for about one week. After this time, the recording may be viewed by anyone with an all access pass. Third, regarding upcoming events and activities, please watch your email for announcements from OSEG about other upcoming webinars. You can view information about these upcoming webcasts on the OSEG site. So today we will address the following learning objectives. We will outline the challenges in ESG and the failure of short-term thinking, determine the business value of ESG, identify ESG priorities and added value opportunities through materiality assessment, and define technology benefits for ESG integration and outcome evaluation. But before we hand over the presentation to our speakers, we'd like to offer our first poll. So again, please be sure to answer this poll question if you are interested in receiving CPE credit for this event. The first poll question is, do you have an OSEG All Access Pass, which is a paid membership, and would you like to receive CPE credit for this event? So as you are answering this poll, I'd like to hand over the presentation to our speakers to begin our discussion today. Thanks, Melissa. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is Carol Switzer. I'm the co-founder and president of OSEG. Before we begin, I'd really like each of our speakers to tell you a little bit about themselves and how it is that they came to be involved in um, issues around ESG. So I'll start. Um, many of you might know that before we started OSEG back at the end of 2002, I had been a partner uh, in a national environmental law practice. And for the prior 18 years or so, I had worked with a number of companies in different sectors, um, energy, minerals and mining, uh, government contractors, 
to develop their approach to environmental regulatory compliance and sustainability in the later years with an eye towards how to address these issues within the context of their business and their business objectives. So as ESG has developed, it's been a really comfortable space for me to revisit and, and to learn more about. Carl, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thanks, Carol. I'm a former bank executive who was involved in GRC, Governance, Risk and Compliance, and OSEC. ESG is an increasingly critical component to my clients, much like GRC is. I founded Strata, GRC, Strata ESG to help companies build capabilities and communicate their sustainability stance to their stakeholders, customers, and investors. Uh, I think there's a bright future in GRC as well as ESG. Thanks, Carl. Mark, how about you? Thanks, Carol. Hey, everyone. Mark Waller, as Carol mentioned, my managing director in our GRC technology practice here at KPMG and very excited to be talking to you today. My background is in systems engineering and data and technology, particularly in the risk space. Uh, and I help clients uh, use technology and particularly GRC technologies to manage their risk and transform their risk activities. And ESG is increasingly becoming a hot topic with our clients. Uh, and so I'm part of our KPMG impact team which is looking at how we address uh, the very broad space of ESG for our clients. And Svetlana, tell us about yourself. Thanks, Carol. Very excited to be here recording this webinar. And uh, yes, uh, my background is actually similar uh, in some ways to yours, Carol. I started my career in the environmental space. I actually worked for the US Environmental Protection Agency for several years. And then I uh, made a career um, kind of pivot into corporate social responsibility as it was called more commonly back then. Um, I worked for several large uh, technology companies, all of which were headquartered in the San Francisco Bay Area in their sustainability or corporate social responsibility departments. Um, and as of about four months ago, I joined ServiceNow to become, I did another career pivot into um, marketing. So I'm the uh, senior product marketing manager for ServiceNow's new recently announced ESG offerings, including a new product. Terrific. So I think this mix of backgrounds will be really interesting as we move through our discussion today. I just want to start by you know, focusing a little bit on what we mean by ESG. And I, I say that because many different writers and speakers talk about ESG with their own sort of definitional approach. When we're talking about ESG, in the environmental aspect, we're really uh, looking at what you need to do and be able to report on regarding the actions that your organization takes to ensure a safe and sustainable planet for everyone. And this can often involve actions in addressing biodiversity protection, uh, managing the supply chain for environmental control, uh, being concerned about deforestation and obviously greenhouse gases and climate change are a huge aspect of the E in ESG. The S is about making work more equitable, more accessible, uh, and, and, and preventing exploitation and human rights abuses. So in some organizations, they'll address controls over uh, often the third party labor provisions, um, ensuring that they're not effectively supporting the use of modern slavery. Um, general human rights practices and, and just ensuring res responsible sourcing overall and also investing in the communities where companies have operations, particularly in emerging economies. The governance piece is really about a stakeholder demand for increased transparency into business conduct and practices and a move towards ensuring that businesses don't just support their 
shareholders, but support all of their societal stakeholders. Um, and that, you know, there are economies, societal economy based goals that every business has to participate in supporting. So often people are looking at issues around board diversity and independence of board members, general mechanisms for board conduct and culture, as well as how the board oversees um, everything in terms of ethical behavior and conduct throughout the organization. So I wanna start our discussion with you, Svetlana, to ask, you know, since you were engaged early on in sustainability and corporate social responsibility issues, how do you see this current focus on ESG developing beyond these earlier attentions to sustainability? Is there a difference? And, and what are the investors and stakeholders seeking to learn from asking about ESG capability and actions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Carol. So it's interesting, ESG is both kind of old and new. The term has been around for, for decades now, and it was just a very niche investor term uh, for, uh, for many, many years. Um, and it was applying to certain just small groups of investors that were looking to uh, only invest in companies that aligned with their values. So ESG was a, a screening uh, kind of concept for screening out certain types of uh, stocks from portfolios. And it really was largely um, at least uh, kind of commonly understood as a moral imperative driven um, activity. However, uh, and then uh, in addition to the earlier investor interest, the in interest in sustainability, especially environmental, but then also, of course, on the social side, human rights uh, became to um, be a, more of a brand and marketing building initiative. In fact, my two first uh, roles in uh, corporate social responsibility or corporate sustainability we reported into, I was at HP and then um, at eBay, I reported into marketing and communications. So that kind of tells you like, you know, that's who was funding these initiatives um, in the company. Um, however, since about 2017, uh, the number and amount of not just the niche ESG investors, or they were also called socially responsible investors, SRIs, um, the, not just those groups, but mainstream investors, particularly institutional investors, recognizing the importance of ESG issues to company performance in the long term has uh, just taken, taken a huge increase. And I would say a kind of a seminal moment was in 2017, um, I actually remember seeing an article in the New York Times. It was like on the front page and my husband sent it to me and said, this is going to be huge for, uh, for, your, <laughs> for your career, for, um, for kind of the ESG sustainability space. The article was about uh, the letter that, the annual letter that Larry Fink, um, head of BlackRock wrote to all the CEOs in, uh, in their portfolio companies, CEOs of their portfolio companies saying that sustainability is important. They need to do reporting. They need to pay attention to climate change. It's a material risk to the economy, to the companies, to the value of BlackRock's portfolio. And that while investors were already, mainstream investors were already asking for these things that really the Larry Fink letter um, in 2017 and then his every subsequent annual letter has gained a lot of attention and a lot of other investors, such as, you know, the ones that are on this slide and beyond State Street Fidelity, 
really, um, I don't want to say they followed suit because maybe a lot of them also were doing similar things, but there's just been a groundswell of investor interest, mainstream investor interest. And another uh, kind of way that I experienced it personally is that prior to, again, kind of 2017, 2016, 2017, um, at my uh companies, we would have conversations with the investor relations department, trying to get them um, more engaged in our work and um, incorporating into things like the quarterly um, call transcripts and such. But the response was, and it was understandable, they were saying, well, we're not really being asked by investors about this, and they had to prioritize the topics that were of interest. And fast forward to now, when uh, there are many companies are having public companies, I should say, is what I'm more familiar with, are having regular conversations, regular engagements with, um, again, not just the socially responsible investors, but mainstream institutional investors on various ESG topics. I mean, I've been in conversations where an investor asked about um, a certain type of carbon emissions and like, what was that number? So they really read the report. They were asking detailed questions that I thought was um, like, I couldn't even imagine that um, a few years ago. So it's been, yeah. it's really. Yeah. That's really, that, that is really an interesting change to, to, to see. Uh, this year, um, KPMG uh, did a survey of CEOs. Um, Mark sent this to me, um, and it indicated that 61% of the CEOs are really leaning into their corporate, you know, mission, vision, and values to drive action on ESG initiatives. Mm -hmm. Mark, do you think this evidences a shift to longer-term thinking overall, uh, uh, you know, an analysis about organizational objectives, consideration of ESG when setting corporate objectives? Yes, I do, Carol. And, and you know, that shift is, is coming rapidly as Svetlana just laid out. And this is certainly on the forefront of CEOs and our clients' minds. Um, if I think about ESG um, and sort of the, the metrics that are within that, a lot of those, I would say, are already related to uh, many of our clients' purpose and value. So there's a sort of a natural relation there. But really, this is boiling down to, you know, a uh, change management program and driving change within your organization uh, and focusing on um, financial metrics, but also these new non-financial metrics and being able to make commitments to those metrics uh, and tracking progress over time. And so if you think about, you know, how does a company drive that change? Well, you want to have inspired teams working on those changes. You want to have purpose-driven teams. You want teams that feel like they're making a difference uh, and not necessarily just driving towards the bottom line. Uh, and in my experience, driving change, you know, for our clients and even within KPMG, always better to have that be purpose driven uh, and aligned to your values. Um, and additional, you know, in terms of long term value, you know, there's research, uh, much research, I would say, in the market around, um, you know, ESG metrics and their correlation to long term business success to a business's overall financial sustainability. Uh, and to me, that's why, you know, a lot of attention is now being drawn to this space because investors and other stakeholders alike realize that this is a great indicator of a business's long-term success. Mm -hmm. Carl, you often, you know, kind of talk to me or, or, or wax poetic to me about the damage done by short-term thinking. Um, how do you see this shift in interest in ESG potentially moving boards towards, a, and CEOs really, towards a longer point of view? Sure, I think it involves uh, stakeholders uh, is really what it comes down to. So if you look at your ability to attract investors uh, as they select more and more for companies that have a great sustainability footprint and plan, they invest in those companies. Uh, younger uh, millennial type investors also have an affinity towards companies that have a great sustainability uh, stance. Uh, your ability to attract talent, uh, people who would work for companies that have uh, a good 
good reputation in the marketplace for their sustainability, uh, their ESG stance, uh, customer affinity. So I think it's, I don't want to call it table stakes, uh, but increasingly moving forward, not only from a doing business value point of view, but from a regulatory point of view, uh, it's, you've got to focus on ESG, what your program looks like, uh, and how you're meeting those needs of stakeholders. So, so what I want to ask you, Carl, you know, what does a long-term strategic plan around ESG offer in terms of not just complying with requests from your stakeholders for reporting, but for making decisions uh, that support corporate objectives? How does, how do, you know, we've talked about um, assessing materiality of ESG for the business. So maybe you could get into some detail for us about what that really means. Sure, so I think there's some pretty strong lessons to be learned from GRC governance risk and compliance, risk management in particular. Uh, there's organizations at companies that have uh, different focus areas, privacy, information security, market risk, credit risk, uh, any number of a uh, number of things in that second line. I see ESG going a similar path where uh, there's groups that are dedicated towards a company's, uh, uh, their program around environment, uh, their leadership and governance, social capital, human capital, uh, their business model. So I think um, I would look at ESG in many companies, they're, they're in a position of uh, reporting uh, what their, their their stances and, and how they're, uh, what they look like from a sustainability point of view. But I think we're in the first inning. Uh, there's many more, uh, much more work to be done. And I think it ingrains itself uh, even more into, uh, into a company's uh, leadership, the, the investments, uh, the direction that they go, uh, much again, like GRC has become uh, ingrained into businesses. Yeah. Yeah, if you think back to that slide I had earlier that showed all kinds of examples of issues that might arise under the E, the S, or the G, obviously these don't all arise for every company. You know, a, a, a manufacturer will have different ESG um, needs or capabilities and reporting than, you know, a chemical manufacturer or mm -hmm. a bank. So. I, I think it would be really helpful if you could kind of walk us through the steps of the materiality assessment process, how an organization uh, determines what aspects of ESG are really relevant to its business operations and to its objectives. Yeah, that's exactly what a materiality assessment does. Uh, taking a step back, it's a tool and a process typically used at the start of ESG planning, uh, either at the start of an ESG program or for annual planning. Uh, what a materiality assessment uh, does essentially is collect feedback to identify and prioritize ESG topics and focus areas. Now there's two participant groups or two groups of stakeholders, internal and external. So internal will be uh, all of the, the different finance group, leadership groups, uh, different uh, corporate areas uh, will be polled with a variety of focus areas and they're asked to rank these in importance, how well they think, feel like the company is addressing those. Then the external uh, stakeholders could be customers, uh, environment groups, affinity groups, um, suppliers, anyone that sits outside of the company that has really... Uh, a view onto that company's ESG focus areas. Um, what they'll do is uh, basically getting a read on these priority, prioritized topics helps build a business case for effort and spend. Uh, if you look and to your point, certain industries are gonna have different areas where they're focused on. A consulting firm may not uh, have that much of a focus on greenhouse gas where something like a manufacturer or a petroleum company will have a lot more involved in that. But uh, getting a read on those topics uh, directs where efforts spend, communication strategies arise, uh, and finally, uh, a look down the road at long-term risks or opportunities 
that can help uh, exceed stakeholder expectations. So going into this, uh, and, and we can use like uh, SASB, they break down 26 broad topics under environment, leadership and governments, social capital, human capital and business model. So the very first is define your scope what materiality means for your organization. Uh, and it's, and, it, and really it is, the objectives are to find out from the stakeholders what they value. Uh, the second is to identify those potential topics uh, that, that fall into those. If we use uh, SASB, uh, they'll, they'll fall into those five buckets, but there's many, many subtopics under each one of those. But you want to present a menu of topics that's meaningful for the two stakeholder groups. Um, categorizing these uh, will cluster them into uh, different areas. So uh, if your company, again, is more focused uh, on a, like an environmental impact, you're going to spend more time talking about uh, wastewater, uh, deforestation, use of the environment, things along those lines. If your company is more of a product company, uh, you may focus more on uh, what you're doing around safety of your product, um, what you're doing to protect your workers. So there's different categories that these topics will be grouped as a part of. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and you know, noting also that you might do different types of categorization, right? Like, you know, what is logical for a particular role to oversee or what might be managed by common controls? So once you've gotten to that stage, what do you do next? Next is you're going to basically reach out to the two stakeholder groups uh, and you'll use a variety of methods. Uh, different companies use different things. Some send out an online questionnaire. You may hold a workshop, uh, do interviews. Um, and really you start to gather those stakeholder uh, views on the different topics. Um, obviously, um, I'll give you an example, somebody internal that may be involved with uh, the IT organization, they may value data security, um, privacy issues, um, frameworks around uh, data governance, things along those lines, and they'll rank those higher. Uh, maybe an external uh, group may be uh, involved uh, or, or value labor practices or employee safety or uh, corporate compensation. They're gonna rank their topics the way that they want. Uh, and at the end, uh, you'll get a, a the, the end result of a materiality assessment is a matrix that uh, shows where those different points fall on a continuum, both from a internal value, uh, internal stakeholder value and an external stakeholder value. From there, uh, you can take a look at uh, some of the, the, the areas where uh, companies uh, or your stakeholders think you're doing well. You may not, uh, you may say, hey, we're doing good there. And you may look at uh, areas where there's improvement that's needed. And that's where you start to allocate uh, effort, budget, focus, uh, and communication. So uh, after the interview process and you gathered the data, you, uh, leadership has some priorities and some decisions to make based on what that materiality assessment uh, is telling them. Yeah. So leadership makes decisions. Uh, they, they set uh, the, the, the priorities for every year. Um, and if they're not meeting the priorities, obviously uh, investors and, and shareholders will look elsewhere, but uh, their, their job is to really start to prioritize uh, and um, moving forward, ask the stakeholders, hey, uh, over a, cont a continuity of a continuum of time, how are we doing? Are we meeting your needs? Are you happy with what we're doing? Uh, and that can take form with focus groups, uh, feedback from a sustainability report, uh, things along those lines where stakeholders can weigh in uh, or an annual materiality assessment. Uh, it's not meant to be done just once and then put on a shelf. Uh, it is a continuous uh, tool to continually calibrate uh, the direction of what your priorities are from an ESG point of view. Thanks, Carl. Mark, you've been involved as well in helping organizations uh, down this path. What, what are the biggest challenges that you see in performing materiality assessments right now? 
Yeah, so a lot of our clients, you know, come to us as, you know, a bit of an outside independent perspective and, you know, say, hey, wh where do we start? And I, I think the the phases that Crow laid out are a good structure uh, to walk through. In addition to that, um, you know, having a methodology uh, that sort of formalizes your process and that you can use to communicate to this various um, or, or group of various stakeholders uh, is important. And, and that can include things like proper scoring uh, and understanding how you're going to score topics that include things like you know, your categories and making sure they're at the, the same level or the right level of granularity to get the outcome that you want. Um, and so a lot of the times clients will, will bring us in to help with that. Um, and I would actually, you know, make an analogy to enterprise risk management where, you know, we see a lot of our clients use that tool uh, as part of their uh, overall strategy planning and, and look at the, you know, most important and largest risks to their, their company and, and trying to get, you know, stakeholders from across the organization to do that. You have a very similar process when you're looking at material topics um, and you can draw from your internal stakeholders and you can draw from out, out, uh, external sources as well, whether that be, analyst reports or looking at benchmarks from your competitors and the reports that they're putting out. Yeah, I, I want to take, take a pause and, um, oh, sorry, run our next poll. Um, we want to know whether your organization has undertaken an ESG materiality assessment, uh, entity-wide or at least in some parts of the organization. If you don't know, just say you don't know. It, and it may not be called that in your organization, but the, the question is really, you know, have, have you evaluated at all um, what aspects of ESG impact what parts of your organization so that you aren't trying to boil the ocean and tackling things that may not even really apply to your organization? Um, and then I want to ask you, Mark, uh, let's continue on. What, once you've done this, once you've determined materiality, what do you do next? And is there you know, a place uh, in that process of determining materiality and then managing the aspects you find material? Is there a, how, how does ESG technology assist when you're doing that? But is there something in between determining materiality and moving toward the application of ESG technology. Yeah, so th thanks, Carol. You know, ESG technology, is, it's a very broad term given that the ESG space is so broad. So I think being specific about what we're using technology for is important. Um, but in terms of, you know, after you have your materiality assessment, um, you know, usually you will look at your topics and set some sort of goals um, or targets um, that you want your company to achieve over a specific timeline uh, and start to communicate those both internally and externally. And then typically the next thing we see is establishing a baseline for those goals and targets. So you can understand as an organization, you know, where you are on those goals. Oftentimes you are creating metrics um, that may be new and may not be, or may not have been tracked in the past. And so collecting the data, uh, reporting on those metrics for the first time gives you an understanding of where you are and um, you know, how far you may have to go to reach your goals. And that's one place that you can use technology. So um, you know, we've had a lot of clients talking to us uh, particularly about the E space, the environmental space, and the fact that you know, depending on the industry they are in, they may not have looked at environmental data in the past. And their data may not be you know, neatly and nicely filed away into a data warehouse. And for them to pull a report or generate a report, it's a lot of manual data collection. And so there's technologies out there that can help you with that and get your data um, clean and in the format and integrated into you know, a single database where you can generate reports. Um, so that, that's one place you can apply uh, ESG technology. Then once you have your baseline, you know, a lot of our clients then start thinking about, okay, this is great. I know where I am. I know where I want to go. How do I actually get there? So we also have clients talking to us about things like, you know, their decarbonization journey and what sort of capital investments do they need to make? Or in the sort of S space in the human capital uh, world, 
you know, how do I change what I'm doing um, around recruiting or around retention of, of my um, employees um, and potentially even around, you know, how my executives are, are compensated if we think about the, the G space um, and what sort of programs or projects do I need to uh, initiate uh, to start driving change along those metrics. And so there are technologies um, that allow you to do that. It allows you to set up a program and manage a program or manage a set of projects. Um, and then really, once you have those in place, it is important to do things like track your progress on those projects. So setting up particular KPIs uh, or KRIs around um, what you're doing in that space is also very important. Um, and I would say maybe maybe one more thing in terms of action to take, it's, you know, doing your formal reporting that you're going to issue uh, to investors or to the public um, and uh, looking at making sure that data is complete and accurate, making sure that data is well controlled, you know, eventually making sure that, you know, the data that you're reporting will be able to be verified uh, through a third party, perhaps uh, as part of an attestation effort. Um, and that's, that's another place where we're seeing a lot of technology, technology vendors play is, is helping our clients pr produce that formal report and doing it in a way that's complete and accurate uh, and uh, able to be independently verified down the line. Yeah, that, that's really interesting to me. And so we're really talking about two kinds of reports, right? The external reports that you're going to give to those stakeholders and to the public, customers, visibility uh, and that you might use in your you know public relations uh, campaigns as well but then you have the internal reports you know what how, you need to be able to track the progress of your projects and identify places that you have savings and identify new business opportunities and so having all of those having established the right metrics becomes really important. Mm -hmm. Carol, um, I just, uh, can I just uh, add a couple more things to the, to the cycle and then the reporting? Yeah. If you don't mind, I uh, just wanted to, on the cycle, definitely all uh, the, the ESG cycle that we were discussing, all uh, very important pieces of it. Um, some organizations, many organizations, when they undertake a materiality assessment may actually find that they're not starting from, um, from square one. So I think that's good news. If uh, a company has been doing any kind of energy efficiency work, renewable energy investments, just because of internal interest, cost savings, um, interest, um, any kind of stakeholder interest um, externally, that means that something has already been done and can be reported and celebrated. Same thing with any kind of diversity inclusion work, um, data privacy for some companies, you know, they've been tackling that for a while, cybersecurity. So I think um, a lot of companies have been doing a lot of ESG um, work and have had initiatives that maybe just haven't been classified as and put had this new ish ESG label put on them. So I think that's, um, that's kind of a positive thought to start out with. And then on the data side, I just want to second what Mark said um, about technology being needed to meet uh, investor and other stakeholder, but really investor expectations. Um, I've talked in my previous roles a lot about investor grade data, putting out investor grade ESG data. That wasn't as much of a necessity even like five years ago, um, since a lot of the efforts were really voluntary. They were, you know, brand building, marketing related. But now uh, assurability is important. Timeliness is really important. Uh, completeness and without some kind of formal technology system and the ESG uh, departments, sustainability departments are generally still fairly small without some kind of technological support, being able to meet those expectations is just not 
uh, it's not realistic because the amount of expectations is growing, the amount of data is growing, and having things in spreadsheets and slides and you know sent around by email between people like that just can't be scaled to the level that it needs to be now. I think that's a really important point. And, you know, from my back past experience as well, it, it used to be that people would put out maybe a sustainability report with a lot of platitudes. And not only was it very difficult to dig behind it and to see what the data on which those statements were based, the reality is there very often wasn't any data on which those statements were based. They were sort of a, 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 a qualitative assessment, kind of gut feeling overview, but not really supported by data. Whereas today, we're not only capable of having that data, it's being demanded. And the way that investors make their decisions is so much more data driven than a decade ago. So I think that's a really important point. So that kind of leads naturally into my next set of questions for you, Mark, about you know, what are the key aspects of technology functionality that we should be looking for? Or to flip that another way, what questions should we be asking technology vendors and what answers do we want to hear? And if you can, tell us a little bit about where you still see weaknesses or where you know developments are still growing in a, in a lot of those technologies. I think you know maybe we can spend about 10 minutes on that and then we'll go into some other questions. Sure. Thanks, Carol. You know, th this is a, you know, a set of questions that I've been asking myself, you know, every day and that our clients are asking us as you know, advisors in the technology space. Um, so, you know, a, a topic that I'm very excited to talk about and one that continues to evolve every, every week or every month, it seems with, with new vendors coming up with new products. Um, you know, to, just to answer your, your questions around um, or your question around what questions uh, should be asked, you know, I think the, the first thing that I would advise is to just get clarity on the use cases. Um, a lot of our clients are, uh, you know, having vendors call them and say, hey, we have an ESG technology. Great. What does that actually mean? What problems are you trying to solve for and what use cases are you addressing? Um, that, that's really the, the first step to sort of clarify. Um, and then I would say, you know, we'll go through these slides that have, you know, a handful of, of key things. But to sort of group them all together, num number one, um, you know, a lot of uh, the ESG problem statements are very similar to the GRC problem statements. Um, so looking at questions you would you know, ask a GRC vendor, whether it be around risk management or controls or issue management, those are all key things. Um, looking at the data problem and the data challenges. So you know, what, what can it do around data collection, data governance, data cleaning, data analysis? Uh, a third category might be content. So looking at, um, you know, the frameworks or calculators uh, that are supported uh, based upon, um, you know, what you can do within the application. Uh, and really overall, you know, can it be a, a system of change? Uh, so, if, you know, ESG is new to your, your company and you're trying to drive new processes, perhaps trying to automate as much of that as you can, you know, can you use that technology as a system of change? So with all that being said, um, I'll go through a handful here of specific things that we're seeing and, and talk to our clients about, um, starting with what you have here on the slide. So um, I'm going to start in the middle here with asset. Um, so, you know, this is really, I would say, a, a fundamental or foundational element um, that we see, particularly in the e-space, um, because a lot of the, the calculations that you're going to have to apply factors to really rely on having those uh, assets identified, having that data be complete and accurate. And again, if, if you don't have a system of record for your assets, you know, there's a, a challenge around um, getting that data and the governance around that. So having a system to help you do that is very important. Uh, the, the other two on the slide, data aggregation and reporting are probably the two that um, have generated the most volume of conversations uh, with the clients that I've spoken with. Uh, and so when we think about data aggregation, you know, what does that mean? Well, 
you're you're pulling data together from a number of different sources to be able to do calculations um, and to be able to generate those metrics that you're reporting on. And whether it be you know trying to do a, a calculation of greenhouse gas emissions um, or just trying to report on um, you know the, the level of diversity that you have across your organization, a lot of times that that data has to be pulled manually. And so having a uh, technology solution that can help you automate some of that manual process, uh, whether that be through you know some sort of workflow or you know, generating or excuse me creating APIs. Uh, that can pull data and bring it into one spot. Uh, and then some of the downstream analytics that you might want to do. Uh, we're seeing a lot of our clients ask about that. Um, and then in terms of reporting, you know, we, we touched on that a little bit earlier in the call. You know, there, there's the reporting around metrics and then there's the reporting around, you know, the change that you're driving across your organization. So in terms of metrics, you know, having the flexibility to adapt to different frameworks is very important. Uh, a lot of our companies or a lot of our clients, you know, are asking us which framework should they be ad adopting. It's, it's a space that's constantly uh, evolving right now. And so having that flexibility to, to change and pivot as you need to over time is important. Um, and, and having reporting that can be uh, auditable. Um, there's an expectation that, you know, our clients will want to have their ESG reports or their CSR reports uh, eventually uh, be looked at by a third party, an independent auditor. And so technology can help you do that as well. And then on the change reporting side, um, you know, being able to collect data uh, across the programs that you are running um, such that you can inform decision makers, um, you know, to, to manage that change and perhaps uh, change course if need be during the course of those projects and programs is also important. Uh, the next three we have here are around um, repository governance excuse me, risk performance supplier and then process standardization. Um, so risk and performance, you know, that's, um, I would say something that we see um, in terms of, again, managing the change that you're driving and providing visibility to that, that progress. Uh, and so being able to collect the right data for things like KRIs and KPIs um, is very important. Establishing controls around your processes and then you know, being able to feed those controls uh, ideally in an automatic way, for example, using continuous control monitoring uh, is very valuable and can you know, lead your organization to be more data driven and more automated, which all of our clients are looking to do. Um, supplier is a, another topic that, um, you know, is very important for a couple of different reasons. Number, number one, you know, there's a lot of expectations around compliance. Um, for your supply chain and the ESG metrics um, that you're measuring across your supply chain. So, for example, uh, in Germany, you know, there's a new Supply Chain Due Diligence Act that was passed um, that is requiring uh, large entities to uh, validate the impact in terms of human rights as well as environmental impact that their supply chain is, is uh, incurring. And we expect uh, similar um, compliance uh, or regulation to come down in the rest of the EU and eventually in the US and all across the globe. So there's a sort of regulatory uh, impact there and being able to have a system that collects that, the data that you need to evaluate your vendors, um, you know, potentially integrating with third party data is important there as well. Uh, and, and getting a hold of, of what your supply chain looks like and the risk that you're seeing there. Uh, and then finally, process standardization. So what does that mean? Well, you know, Again, you're creating change in the organization. You're gonna be developing new processes. Um, how do you get your employees to understand what those new processes are? You know, typically that's through some level of documentation. Uh, documentation. Uh, and then the more that you can standardize those processes, the more that they can be automated. Uh, and so being able to have technology that uh, drives that automation for you, drives that workflow uh, for you is a, a way to quickly uh, enable that standardization and enable that automation. I'm going to take a quick breath there. <laughs> we have more. Yeah, so three more here. So uh, repository governance, security and reliance. So, you know, the idea of, of having a repository is, is uh, kind of a found, uh, fundamental thing of GRC systems. So having your, you know, foundational elements stored in one place and being able to take, that, uh, take action on those 
foundational elements um, is something that we see in a lot of GRC platforms and being able to make sure that that's one source of truth um, and sort of the integrity around the data in those systems uh, is very important. Uh, on the governance side, you know, th this is a, a huge piece, right? We're, we're driving change across a number of stakeholders who may not always be used to working together. Uh, and so again, being able to manage um, the projects and the programs that you're uh, executing against and being able to govern those investments in those programs and, and projects is very important uh, and providing information to leadership about you know, how you're progressing such that they can make informed decisions on you know, potential changes to the, to the path uh, or even you know, potential changes to the guidance around the metrics is, is really crucial. And then you know, with any technology system that you're going to implement and use, you obviously want to have it be secured and resilient. So you know, having a, uh, you know, the ability to um, protect against cybersecurity um, is obviously important. You know, using modern technology like uh, cloud-based uh, you know, SaaS providers uh, will help you with your, your resilience and help you be able to scale at the pace that you really need to. That's a lot. That's a lot of functionality that we're looking for in our technology for ESG. Svetlana, are, are we seeing all of these capabilities um, already being fully developed in, in available technologies? They are in a process of development, I think. And um, I expect that there will be a lot more uh, such capabilities on the market. Just from, uh, from what we are seeing, uh, there are many, many uh, what we're calling point solutions, point products for managing aspects of ESG, um, uh, of the ESG space. And many of them have been around for quite a while. For example, environmental health and safety software, lots of mm -hmm. software providers offering carbon emissions, uh, management reporting, tracking tools, and those products are evolving. The, uh, the approach that we're talking about here that is much more holistic and includes things like governance um, and also importantly, flexibility and an ability to adapt to evolving, rapidly evolving and expanding stakeholder needs, regulatory needs, reporting frameworks that is uh, currently, I would say, um, still under development. The technology is, is also rapidly evolving. And um, that's, uh, I mean, that is what we, our, our offering is and our vision is um, at service now, if you excuse the, the plug, the, uh, what we are offering is we are offering a, a management reporting product that covers many of the functionalities like such as the repository that is on this slide, but really beyond that also allows users, companies to, um, uh, there, we offer a solution that goes beyond just management and reporting and allows companies to embed, to connect, uh, to govern, and to execute, plan and execute projects across the ESG spectrum and to ultimately report them. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm excited to see where the, um, where the technology is going to go. The technology is going to be um, driven, of course, by demand, by uh, society, by stakeholders, by investors for not just, uh, you know, kind of a box checking exercise of ESG data collection and reporting, but to true holistically managed, governed, strategic programs. Yeah. And that's, um, that's where yeah. I think it's heading. I, I have to say, I see the day when at least investor stakeholders are going to say, hey, don't just give me a report, give me a report that's in a format where I can dig down into it, where I can click on statements in your report and it'll take me to the data that backs up that statement or otherwise gives me the opportunity to really, you know, have a, have a deeper look myself. 
And that will be interesting and also very challenging, but I'm sure that day is coming. Yeah. So before we get into some other questions, I just want to run our last poll. We want to know if you are personally involved in ESG efforts today in your organization. And this is a select all question. So if you're involved in more than one way, feel free to pick multiple answers here. Um, and while you're doing that, I I'm going to go ahead to, to some of the questions that we have, because we have a lot. Um, let me say first, I'm sorry, we won't be able to get to all of the um, attendees' questions. Uh, we will pass them along to the speakers, so they'll be able to follow up with you individually. Um, I do have some questions about wanting to see demos of ServiceNow's ESG offering. If you want that, just type it in the question field. You know, I'd like to get a demo. Or if you know you want to have follow up with Carl or Mark just about performing an assessment or assessing your maturity, just put specifically who you want to talk to in your question field and we'll make sure they get uh, those requests. Um, the, the first question I want to address is um, the relationship between ESG and GRC, specifically with regard to technology. You know, isn't ESG just a subset of GRC? And so is its technology separate or is it connected to and operating in a sense within or next to, but connected to the GRC technology? Um, Mark, why don't we ask you that first? Yeah, thanks, Carol. So I would say that, um, you know, Again, ESG is a, a broad space and, and can be a broader space than um, your maybe standard thoughts around uh, GRC. But certainly the, the technology and the processes that we see executed through a GRC technology are directly applicable to ESG. So if you think about managing your risks, uh, assessing your risks, uh, you'll need to be doing that in terms of what are your e at risk, your SG, uh, S risk, your G risk. If you think about um, you know, managing from a compliance standpoint, standpoint, that is gonna be critical in terms of an ESG space uh, issue management. So as you identify you know, things that are not going to plan in terms of your ESG program, you know, being able to use a D GRC technology or that type of functionality is critical. However, there are also you know, many other things um, that not all GRC technology providers provide we've talked about earlier, like for example, you know, being a change agent and being able to drive projects and um, programs and being able to drive, you know, workflow around that. Um, being able to embed, uh, you know, risk management uh, and ESG management into your workflows is not something that every GRC platform uh, can do. Uh, being able to do, you know, detailed reporting in terms of, you know, integrating into a financial uh, uh, statement report not something that a typical GRC platform can do. So I would say generally speaking, there's a, a lot of overlap, particularly around the, the risk control uh, and issue management space, but certainly the ability to extend uh, into a, a larger space in terms of what technology can do for an ESG program. I, I do want to mention, I neglected to do this at the beginning, that everything that our presenters have been speaking about today, uh, we've addressed in some detail as well in a ebook that uh, OSEG has put out, sponsored by uh, KPMG and ServiceNow and authored by Carl and myself, called um, Operationalizing the ESG Business Imperative. If you haven't downloaded that yet, you can go to the OSEG site, click on the resources tab, um, and select ebooks or ESG under topics, and, and you'll come to it pretty quickly. Um, and that sort of leads into my next question, which is for Svetlana, you know, how specifically can you give us some tips on how to make a business case for um, acquiring ESG technology? Mm -hmm. Sure. One, I think it kind of follows on from what I mentioned earlier that the volume of, uh, 
requests, even just for reporting, even if we just look at the data reporting piece and really ESG technology goes way beyond just data management and reporting. But even that, because of the um, annual report that pretty much companies are expected to do um, aligned with GRI, mapped to SASB standards, um, that takes a lot of time, especially as re the reports are becoming more scrutinized. Um, investors, board members are asking very specific questions about what's in there. Just the um, woman and man hours involved in putting together those reports are in the you know hundreds of hours and um, technology would really help uh, cut down that those hours to produce the the quality of reports that are needed but even just beyond those those basic frameworks there is um, a, and a proliferating number of um, ESG ratings and rankings which I haven't even, gotten into, but things like CDP, Sustainalytics, MSCI, ISS, um, I can go on and on and they're expanding. They, these entities take, uh, they kind of scrape public ESG data from companies, they assign ratings, they make the information available to investors and responding to those questionnaires, validating those questionnaires takes another, um, you know, amount of hundreds of hours. And um, in order to meet all of those needs, which are projected to only increase, technology is really um, important because it's not, uh, it's exceeding like the human ability to keep right. up with them. Right. Thank you, Svetlana. Uh, I'm, I'm sad to say we are out of time. We have a lot of really interesting questions. If you haven't done it yet, uh, please put your questions into the question field. We will make sure to pass those along. Mark, Carl, and Svetlana, thank you so much for being with us today. And everybody, have a great day. Thanks, Carol. Thank you.